Ta meriterebbe una lunga introduzione. Il professore Donald Winch è professore emerito di storia intellettuale alla Università del Sussex ed è praticamente il fondatore della Sussex School of Intellectual History, dove hanno eh, messo le fondazioni per lo studio approfondito della storia del pensiero economico. E, eh, Donald Winch è un grande specialista, forse il massimo specialista del pensiero economico di da Adam Smith a John Stuart Mill, ha scritto libri su Smith, su John Stuart Mill, su Malthus eh, e anche eh, il suo libro su Adam Smith è in italiano, si chiama appunto La politica di Adam Smith e eh, per di più tra i suoi vari eh, onori dove ha insegnato in in, nell'Università di Mezzomondo e anche eh, fellow, dunque membro dell'Accademia Britannica del quale è stato anche vicepresidente. Ci parlerà oggi di Adam Smith e dei suoi successori. Do con molto piacere la parola a Donald Winch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Capital, capitalist capitalism. This simple triptych summarizes the chronological order in which these potent concepts emerged with a significant interval between capital and capitalism. The triptych serves as a warning against those proleptic readings of the past that have been the source of systematic misunderstanding of the intellectual scene I shall be sketching in this lecture. Thus, while Adam Smith has a great deal to say about the crucial role of capital in his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, the capitalist, under that name at least, does not appear. And as we heard last night uh, from our chairman, Capitalism has no place whatsoever in Smith's vocabulary. Therefore, if we wish to assess his views on what we now understand by that word, some careful historical reconstruction, as contrasted with unhistorical attribution, is required. When we move to Smith's immediate British and French successors, capitalist becomes a little more common, but capitalism still cannot be found in the writings of Robert Malthus, David Ricardo, James Mill, Jean-Baptiste Say, and other key economic commentators during the first half of the 19th century. The capitalist system is mentioned once or twice in the work of John Stuart Mill, representing the mid-century generation of political economists but capitalism never became part of Mill's lexicon. Now that may seem puzzling because Mill was familiar with socialism, a politico-economic term that increasingly featured as the natural antonym, even perhaps as the unintended byproduct of capitalism. Now this brief opening excursion into linguistic chronology confirms what many students already know or suspect. The insistent use of capitalism as a term of critical and interpretative art effectively belongs with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Even so, it is still worth observing that the word capitalism does not appear in their earliest works. Engels condition of the working class in England and their joint production, the Communist Manifesto of 1848. It can only be found in their mature writings of the 1860s and 70s. The early writings do, however, contain some of the insignia of the mature Marxian position. The proletariat has become a major historical force and capitalists are equated with the bourgeoisie to connect economic diagnosis with 
and historical analysis based on the belief in the inexorability of class struggle. And there's no denying that for a century or more, after the deaths of Marx and Engels, Marxian perspectives have exercised a powerful, some would say distorting influence on the discursive agenda surrounding capitalism and its likely future. For this reason, there's a great deal to be said for returning, as I propose to do, to the pre-Marxian world of Adam Smith. I hope it will prove the value of the French expression, reculer pour mieux citer. Marx learned a great deal from those he was the first to label as classical political economists. But we're not obliged to view the subject exclusively through Marxian lenses. As I've already hinted, we can also engage in historical reconstruction of the views of Adam Smith to guard against the fatal attractions of anachronism. The stereotypical present representation of Adam Smith built up over the past two centuries will be familiar to most people. Smith has been portrayed as the pioneering spokesman for free market capitalism, the embodiment of a liberal capitalist viewpoint, proclaiming the benign capacity of unfettered competition to produce social harmony out of individual self-seeking. In some versions of this, he is the epitome of a Panglossian perspective in which the invisible hand of the market delivers maximum benefits to the population at large under a regime characterized by laissez-faire and minimum interference by the state. The unintended consequences of individual economic decision-making within a system of private property keep society on an optimal evolutionary path. This reputation, which Smith began to acquire during the 19th century, first in Britain and then in an imported form in something called Smithianismus in Germany and elsewhere, reached its apogee in 1990, the bicentenary of Smith's death, which coincided with the disintegration of the Soviet empire. Dedicated free marketeers during the Thatcher-Reagan years could celebrate the triumph of Smithian wisdom over the Marxian arrogance that lay behind the downfall of planned economies in communist states. Reinstating a more credible historical Smith in the face of this caricature has not proved easy. Some stereotypes are powerful because they command support across the ideological spectrum. An Adam Smith who can be cited as the patron saint of, of, <coughs> of modern neoliberal economics is equally acceptable to those who oppose such ideas and need a scapegoat instead of a guru. But a start can be made with Smith's characterization of commercial society, the label he and other 18th century commentators chose to describe the modern type of society that was emerging in Europe and its North American colonies. It was a society, as Smith said, in which every man lives by exchange or becomes in some measure a merchant. Why? Because the division of labor and occupational specialization that comes with this has brought an end to self-sufficiency in most spheres. The process had progressed to the point where satisfaction of an expanding range of daily needs could only be achieved by participating as buyer or seller or both in the markets for goods, services, labor, and of course, capital. There are no heroes or technological miracles in Smith's account of the emergence of commercial society from its feudal integument. Indeed, the story is told with an asperity and an emphasis on unintended consequences that surprised 
some of Smith's friends and contemporaries. The role of the capitalist, those who employ productive labor for the purpose of earning profits on their own or borrowed capital, was occupied by those whom Smith described as merchants and, man and master manufacturers, and occasionally as undertakers and projectors. The last of these were particularly suspect in his eyes. And while the others performed a useful social function as individuals, they were often to be found acting in concert to obtain special privileges at the expense of consumers and taxpayers. Whereas wages and rent were positively correlated with the interest of society as a whole, as represented uh, by the rate of economic growth, the opposite was true of profits. Accordingly, Smith warned that any proposal initiated by profit recipients should be treated with the most suspicious attention. I quote, the proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order ought always to be listened to with great precaution. It comes from an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public, who have generally inter an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public, and who accordingly have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it. There was, however, one group within the capitalist economic class that Smith treated with more sympathy. It was agricultural rather than industrial and commercial, and is best described by the English term yeoman, because Smith believed that in the slow and incomplete process of transition from feudal uh, to commercial society, this type of tenant farming had made greater progress in England than elsewhere. The growth of mercantile and manufacturing activities in the towns had undermined the feudal powers of landowners and induced them to offer longer leases and security of tenure to tenant farmers in return for cash rents. As a result, yeoman farmers had the confidence and incentive to carry out agricultural improvements and reduce the number of, quote, unnecessary mouths that were a burden on the countryside under subsistence farming arrangements. An environment existed in which it was possible for Smith to advocate the sideways reinvestment of commercial profits into agriculture and to justify penalization of irresponsible landowners who failed to make good economic use of their land. In retrospect, one can also say that Smith was giving an explanation for the peculiar tripartite institutional arrangements of English agriculture. Landowners were paid rents for the use of land and farmers employed wage labor in pursuit of profit on their capital. In brief, Smith explains what Malthus Ricardo and all English classical economists assumed as datum. This reveals Smith's priorities as theorist and historian, not so much of capitalism, tout court, but of comparative economic development or retardation. He shared these priorities with Thurgau and the physiocratic sect in granting agriculture a distinctive place in the natural progress of opulence and they underline his special qualities as a political and economic analyst of the transition from feudal to commercial society. Smith's analysis accords well with what demographic historians now tell us was a genuine English peculiarity from the late 16th century onwards. The early capacity to support a large and increasing proportion of the population in urban settings, with London being extra special in this respect. If we feel the need to place Smith 
in the context of revolutionary change, one could summarize by saying he was more interested in an unfinished agrarian revolution than in its emerging industrial successor. Smith succeeded in making capital accumulation central to the process of defining economic growth and general prosperity. Societies could now be classified as progressive, stationary, or declining based on whether they were adding to their capital stock, merely maintaining it, or running it down. Britain's North American colonies were the best contemporary example of a progressive state, less wealthy than the country which had given birth to them, but already enjoying higher wages as a result of the rapidity of its capital accumulation. China and India respectively defined stationary and declining states. At this point, one has to note a major difference between Smith and his immediate followers. Unlike his so-called classical successors, Smith did not treat the stationary state as one that was linked inherently with economic forces or trends. China was stationary because her laws and institutions were unfavorable to trade. The causes and hence the remedies for her condition were political. By contrast, Smith's immediate successes in Britain, notably Malthus and Ricardo, were more preoccupied with the potential economic barriers or limits to growth. The stationary state played a key rhetorical and hypothetical role in their depiction of the growth path of capitalist societies. The growth path of these societies they saw as being asymptotic, rather than exponential, where the limits were posed by rising costs of subsistence as a result of diminishing returns in agriculture. In this way, wage earners could be deprived of the benefits of economic growth, and falling profits could undermine the incentive and capacity to invest in the future. Now, I've used could, the conditional form, because diagnoses and prognoses were accompanied by policy proposals designed to avoid or offset the worst consequences of the trends being discerned. In this respect, both Smith and his followers were operating on variables that were within the boundaries of intelligent, prudential human intervention. The anxieties being articulated by Smith's followers belong to a period dominated by the Napoleonic Wars by growth in public indebtedness and by rapid population growth and the rising cost of supporting the poor under the English poor laws. Smith's open-ended, though hardly rhapsodical, view of the future of commercial society was under threat or in abeyance while these problems were being resolved. Smith had not engaged in long-term prediction. Commercial society was merely the, the latest type of society, not perhaps the last. There were plenty of earlier examples of societies that had succumbed to what Smith described as those ordinary revolutions of war and government. These had brought an end to the progress of opulence in earlier epochs. Witness Rome and the Italian city-states. Smith's hard-nosed realism ruled out optimistic predictions of the kind we associate with some rationalistic Enlightenment visions, the kind of utopian dreams that Malthus attacked in the works of Condorcet and Godwin. Smith could express concern about the growth of public debt associated with war, but he did not share the anxieties about falling profits later expressed by Ricardo and his followers, who now include Karl Marx. Smith did not believe that high profits were necessary to sustain private accumulation. Like Keynes, much later, one could say that he treated capitalism as a game that did not require high stakes for it to be played successfully. 
Indeed, it was better for wage earners and consumers if it was played for low stakes. The concern articulated by Malthus in his argument with Ricardo over post-Napoleonic war depression centered on excess capital accumulation. Malthus was preoccupied question by questions of potential stagnation, harmful oscillations in the levels of economic activity. It was the kind, this kind of concern that attracted Keynes's attention later in the 1930s when he too was searching for clues to underemployment equilibrium. The interwar period focusing on the Great Depression of 1931 was of course a period of intense awareness of the fragility and instability of international capitalism. The emergence of alternative economic systems based on communism and fascism meant that more than speculative plans for an ideal future were at stake. Actual political choices now appeared now to be available. Against this background, Keynes's contribution to the debate was to show that a form of intelligently managed capitalism could avoid the need to make stark choices between capitalism and communism or fascism. Now, by now, these 20th century debates on the future of capitalism, it seems to me, have been thoroughly well observed and understood. The Great Recession of 2008 and beyond has been a reminder, if a reminder was needed, that the global interconnectedness of national economies can operate negatively as well as positively. For that reason, I want to return to the mid-19th century to consider an earlier phase in the intellectual history of attempts to understand capitalism. Marx's Communist Manifesto can be cited here to mark a turning point. This work has the following distinctive feature. It combines a hymn of praise to the merits of the bourgeoisie as technological innovators, a hymn that is far more celebratory than anything that to be found in the contemporary bourgeois literature, though it's often been matched by, of course, 20th century apologists. It combines this celebratory hymn with a vision of imminent revolutionary overthrow of the capitalist system. In depicting the scenario leading up to the latter result, Marx made use of Ricardo's central preoccupation with the secular downward trend of profits, adding to it an extra dimension of materialist teleology. At roughly the same time, John Stuart Mill, a leading neo-Malthusian, offered a different teleology another vision of how capitalism could give way, if not to socialism, then certainly to a more altruistic and less materialist society. Incidentally, I've used the word altruistic, of course that was one of the new words of the period coined by Auguste Comte. Mill maintained that the best state for human nature was one in which, quote, while no one is poor, no one desires to be rich, richer, nor has any reason to fear being thrust back by the efforts of others to push themselves forward. By highlighting the threat posed by growing population to the natural environment, he also introduced a concern that is better appreciated now than it was in the mid 19th century, when the British population, for example, uh, it now is nearer to 70 million than to the 20 million of Mill's day. For Mill, a virtuous version of the stationary state, a world in which population, population growth ceased and capital accumulation was confined to maintenance of the capital stock, would, he hope, shift social priorities towards a more just distribution of effort, income and wealth. As an aside, I suppose I don't need to point out that Mill was as wrong in this 
as Keynes was later when speculating about the end of econ the economic problem of production in his predictions about the economic possibilities for our grandchildren. In their very different ways, Marx and Mill are prominent symbols of ways of thinking about the future of capitalist societies that could be multiplied many times over during the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. With the names of such well-known social scientists as Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, and Joseph Schumpeter, merely being the best known ones. Understanding the mechanics and dynamics of an economic system is an essential preliminary towards justifying or condemning its moral, social, and political underpinnings and concomitants. Widespread recognition that capitalism was the foundation of the political economy of modern nations, it would seem, was accompanied by equally widespread speculation about the peculiarity of its origins, its morals, moral deficiencies, and what kind of society would or should replace it. Consciousness of the deficiencies of societies based on greed and the competitive struggle for riches, of course, have deep cultural roots. Warnings about the dangers of worshipping mammon are not exactly novel in Christian societies where the Sermon of the Mount is widely read. But there are periods when consciousness of the moral deficiencies of capitalistic forms of society is more acute and when, as a consequence, demands for remedies are more pressing. Here again, I want to return to my starting point in the work of Adam Smith. For an early attempt to place these matters in a reasonably dispassionate perspective. One of the unintended results of the wealth of nations was to make the specialist study of economics possible for his successors. What the intended result was meant to be is a more speculative question, though one that intellectual historians like myself it seems to me have an obligation to consider. Smith was primarily a moral philosopher whose first book on the theory of moral sentiments published in the 1850s, the 1750s, he spent the last year of his life revising. One broad way of characterizing his intentions, therefore, in his two main works would be to say that far from wishing to give a blessing to an autonomous body of thinking called political economy, he was looking for a way in which the territory political economy covered could be absorbed or brought within his moral philosophy. And I should like to close this lecture by mentioning two implications of this for the theme of this conference. The first concerns the moral justification for economic behavior in commercial societies and the second concerns what Smith described as mental mutilation, one of the most serious drawbacks of specialization resulting from the division of labor, the defining feature of commercial societies. As moral philosopher, Smith contributed to what for present purposes I'll call the social psychology of commercial society. At some point during the second half of the 19th century, economic behavior became more problematic. It was thought necessary to seek deeper explanations for its successes and to find remedies where possible for its failings. The best known example of this at the turn of the 20th century is provided by the writings of Max Weber on the religious origins of the type of economic rationality to be found in modern capitalist societies. During the 20th century, another prominent example is provided by the writings of the economic anthropologist Karl Polanyi, notably in his book, The Great Transformation, published in 1944. In both these cases, there is a sharp contrast with Smith, who believed that a prudent regard for self-interest and a restless quest 
for a succession of minor improvements in living standards was diffused throughout commercial societies. This motivation could be used to account for some desirable outcomes. For example, Smith cited the lower crime rate in commercial towns when compared with the court settings as one of the incidental benefits of commerce. It was why Paris uh, enjoyed a lower crime rate than Versailles or Glasgow than Edinburgh. <laughs> it also reveals these remarks by Smith, Smith's disdain for servile occupations and the general servility of feudal society. But since prudence was a widely shared, shared human attribute, Smith did not place it high on the list of virtues that we should admire. It commanded, he said, only a cold esteem compared with the more demanding virtues of social and political life. Contrary to the expectations created by the social psychologies of the rise of modern capitalism advanced by Weber and Polanyi, Smith found nothing inherently problematic about self-interested market behavior and the motive for self-improvement that is expressed through private frugality successfully invested for the sake of future return. Both proclivities are brought into spontaneous combustion wherever propitious circumstances exist. <coughs> that is, where opportunities for extensive exchange and the conditions guaranteeing what he called a tolerable degree of security with regard to property can be counted upon. As Smith said, with deceptive simplicity, our ancestors were idle for want of sufficient encouragement to industry. Polanyi thought in saying this that Smith had committed a kind of libel on the anthropological record by fostering back onto pre-capitalist societies those regrettable features of the modern world. The contrast with Weber is less confrontational though often mischaracterized when Smith is treated as an advocate of the utilitarian and compulsively rational maximizing aspects of economic behavior. The kinds of behavior that Weber felt were in need of special explanation as features of advanced Western forms of capitalism. For this to work, Smith has to be endowed with views on economic behavior that can only be found in later economists, notably the explicit assumption of the psychology of rational economic man. Rational economic man does not exist in the world of nations. This fictional character acquired some warrant in the works of Ricardo and John Stuart Mill, and he was to be provided with more precise utility maximizing tools by Bentham and by neoclassical economists. By contrast, Smith felt no need to seek an explanation for modern economic rationality because he did not assume that human beings possessed any special form of rationality. Immediate sense and feeling was more often the uh, kind of mechanisms that he looked to for explaining important social institutions and practices. Insofar as Smith took any interest in the deeper orig origins of exchange, what he called the propensity to truck and barter, he gave it a rhetorical or psycholinguistic character, revealing something distinctive to all language-using creatures. It was based on a basic desire to persuade others to share our view of the world and in so doing, collaborate in meeting our natural and artificial wants. Far from being long-sighted rational creatures, Smith saw us as suffering from, quote, overweening conceit and romantic hopes that le always lead us to overestimate our chances of success in economic ventures. Further aspects of the contrast between Smith and Weber 
can best be explored via Weber's treatment of custom and tradition as an obstacle that the spirit of capitalism had to overcome. We see this in Weber's uh, well-known statement that a man does not by nature wish to earn more and more money, but simply to live as he is accustomed to live and to earn as much as is necessary for that purpose. Weber regarded this as a distinguishing mark of pre-capitalist labor practices and as an explanation for the policy of exploiting the backward bending uh, pro properties of the supply curve of labor by keeping wages low to obtain more effort from the labor force. Smith's account of the same phenomenon ran along entirely different lines. He regarded the case for low wages merely as an argument favored by vested mercantile interests hoping to keep profits high. Offered what the fruits of their productive labor yielded, namely higher wages, and the opportunities to consume a wider range of cheaper goods, there could be no problem with incentives to labor. On all these subjects, I would suggest that we are now closer to Smith than to Weber or Polanyi. Finally, and more briefly, there is the problem of moral and civic impairment that Smith associated with the specialization of tasks, the mental mutilation that he spoke of uh, as being connected with ill-educated urban populations whose working lives offered no variety or scope for forming opinions on what he called the great and extensive interests of their country. For Smith's generation, when classical Republican and related interpretations of public good were still active, there was a military dimension to this. Would immersion in a system of finely divided labor produce a kind of cowardice as a result of the absence of patriotic other regarding dimensions to life? In short, were commercial societies in the present as vulnerable to the military ambitions of barbarous shepherd nations as the Romans had been. Now, as moral philosopher, Smith had stressed the regulatory role played by the social mirror in which individuals observed their own conduct and modified it accordingly. When writing on the social effect of the division of labor in the wealth of nations, the problem was one of noting how that mirror had become occluded losing its power to sustain moral character. As the diverse range of solutions Smith proposed indicates, the underlying problem had to be tackled from a variety of directions. It should also be noted that all of his remedies involved, quote, some attention of government to prevent the almost entire corruption and degeneracy of the great body of the people, not a minor diag a diagnosis of a minor problem. The bare list of his proposed solutions reads as follows. Compulsory elementary education, obligatory militia training to supplement professional standing armies, disestablishment of the official church, and encouragement of the proliferation of religious sects that could fill the gap created by anomic urban conditions, and public support for drama, music, painting, and the arts to overcome the austere manners of the sects. Now, faced with that list, it may seem difficult, perhaps, to argue that Smith is our contemporary. But the underlying rationale is clear enough to offer some modern comparisons. Within the parochial British context, at least, there is some point in noting that what Smith called the gaiety of public diversions um, 
uh, and is has compar has co is comparable to what uh, later uh, Keynes uh, involved himself in, which was the public support for the arts. Um, comparison of this with Juvenal's remarks on the pacifying need of circuses to supplement or complement bread, I think trivializes the argument. Smith was a free marketeer as far as bread was concerned, but not when it came to circuses. Noting this serves as another nail in the coffin of the stereotypical image of Smith that I began with. A Smith as universally hostile to encroachment by the state. Civilized commercial or capitalistic nations, by the emphasis on civilized, not only can afford a large apparatus of state intervention, they need it. Ringrazio. Ringrazio Donald Winch per averci offerto una visione così innovativa di Adam Smith e dei suoi successori e così diversa appunto da tanti stereotipi. Vi invito tutti a tornare domani per il proseguimento della storia in piazza. Informiamo i presenti che alle ore 21 presso questa sala si terrà lo spettacolo di Renato Sarti dal titolo Chicago Boys. Grazie per la vostra attenzione e vi auguriamo a tutti un buon proseguimento di serata.